This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. My name is uh, Descartes Lee, and I'm pleased to uh, chair this UCSF mini medical school series, Science of the Mind, and I'm very pleased to be uh, introducing our, uh, this evening's speaker. Why are you all here today? That's a rhetorical question, because uh, Dr. Johnson is going to tell us about motivation and why we do what we do. So we're going to find out, actually. You're going to find out why we're here. And uh, Dr. Johnson is a professor of psychology and uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, and a visiting professor at the University of Lancaster. Uh, she's conducted research on psychosocial facets of uh, bipolar disorder over the past 20 years, and she directs the CalMania program at UC Berkeley. She has edited and uh, or co-authored six textbooks, including uh, Emotion and Psychopathology in 2007, and uh, The Psychological Treatment of Bipolar Disorder. She has published over 100 articles and chapters, and her findings have been published in several leading journals, such as the Journal of Abnormal Psychology and the American Journal of Psychiatry. She is a fellow of the American Psychological Society and the Academy of Behavioral Medicine Research, and she has won the award for excellence in graduate teaching in the Department of Psychology, University of Miami. She's an excellent speaker. I'm really happy to have her here with us today. Um, I've known her for a while myself. She's been interested in the effects of trauma and positive emotions in psychopathology. And uh, she's going to talk to us this evening about motivation and reward, the motivation to pursue dreams, hopes, and understanding the uh, brain's reward system. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Johnson. Thank you. Thank you for that really lovely introduction, Descartes. Um, and it's just great to be here. This is another moment in my life where I think San Francisco is where I was meant to live because look at you all showing up in the evening to learn more. Um, this is my town. I can't believe how many of you are here just to kind of find out new things about how the brain works. That's really great. Join me in a minute. Uh, join me for a minute in a little bit of a thought experiment. You can close your eyes if you want. Whatever you need to do, I want you to kind of sit still and imagine a scenario. So imagine I walk in here tonight and you have every reason to believe me and I say to you, there are three million dollars and, and they're, the, they're yours to grab if you're the first person to get there. Okay, they're three blocks away. I'm gonna give you a little grid for how you get there. And it's up to you to be the first person there. And so I begin to give you instructions that you're going to head out the front door of this building and you're going to go down to the left two blocks and then you're going to run downhill one block and it's going to be hidden, but it's going to be inside a box that's yay big. Now, if this were true, and I'm sorry to say it's not, I'm already going to let you down this evening, but if it were true, imagine what you need to do to pull this off being the first person down the street three blocks. What are you going to be doing? Okay, so bunches of you are going to be running. Now, wait a minute. There's a whole lot of people going to be running. So what else are you going to be doing? <laughs> You're going to be strategizing a lot, I'm guessing, right? You're going to have your eye on the ball. What's going to be happening in your brain? What are you going to be thinking about? Yeah, so you're, you're drumming through the alternatives. 
Now, what about distractibility? If a friend is texting you with kind of, hey, do you want to get a burger? Are you going to be writing back? <laughs> Probably not. So all other things go out of mind. Your brain gets you focused. You get a roar of energy. Your mind is going a million miles an hour with how am I going to do this? And you're probably feeling pretty inspired. <laughs> pretty miraculous that your brain does all this in pursuit of any goal. And yet every day, every hour, your brain does this for you, right? I mean, we all do things every day because we want to, because it's going to be good, because it's possible, because it's a dream, because it would be nice. And somehow our brain gets us on task, gets us to that mission. And when you think about what you have to do to do that, it's really kind of a small miracle of orchestration. And I find this just a great mystery, how your brain pulls that off for you. Um, I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm not a biologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm a clinical psychologist who got interested in this because I think there's certain groups um, with mood disorders where this becomes really an important part of the puzzle. Um, and the more I started chasing that puzzle, the more I just had to know, okay, well, what the heck? How does the brain work? How do you pull that off? And so I'm gonna try and tell a story tonight of what your brain's doing when you go after those rewards and those hopes and those goals. Um, now, I'm gonna make it a little bit simpler than it is, and, and during the question period, I'm happy to highlight for you how I've simplified. Um, but I'm going to start by trying to draw the big picture, and then we can kind of hone in bit by bit on the different layers of complexity. So bear with me for a, man, a minute and just imagine some different great things that could come true. Imagine you want to eat some chocolate. Maybe you want to earn a million dollars. Maybe you want to be a pop star. I don't know if we have anyone in the room who's already been a pop star. <laughs> Probably we have chocolate eaters in here, I'm guessing. <laughs> Maybe you want to raise a happy family. Maybe you want to fall madly in love and have a terrific relationship. OK, they're all rewards. OK, they're life's rewards. And they're all things that take a lot of motivation, energy and effort to get there. Some of them much more energy and effort. Whatever your dreams are in life, you need a motivational system that helps you get there. And so the question is, how does your brain help you get there? Or even figure out your goal. Why, why is it that some of us are chocoholics and others of us you know, have other dreams and other favorite foods or other, th other things that organize our day? And then how does your brain help you pursue that goal? And if you start to think about that question, you start to think about all the many, many, many things your brain has to effectively do to help you pursue that goal. So I have a lot of goals. I want to define what people think of as being the reward system. How many of you have heard this kind of phrase, the reward system? Wow, OK, so this is a great audience. Um, and you can kind of wave me on. If I'm going over stuff that you all know, fine. We'll go faster and we'll have more fun. Um, I want to break down some of the processes involved in effective reward pursuit. I want to talk about some of the brain regions guiding those processes and how, what we're beginning to figure out about how those work. And then I want to talk about individual differences in this reward system and what those might look like and where the system might break or become dysregulated. And then what that might mean for psychological symptoms and for psychological disorders like mania and depression. So we're going to kind of do a really broad sweep here. And then I'm going to save a lot of time for questions. Um, so. Big picture, before we get too immersed in reward, most um, psychologists and neuroscientists think about two different kinds of motivation that you need to really be effective. Whether you're an animal or a human, you got to move towards certain things and you got to move away from other things. Okay, So people talk about approach, approach or activation system, you'll hear this called, or reward system. Those are all kind of synonyms. Um, and there's no one term that people like best in the field, which is really bewildering. I just went to a panel of 40 scientists at the government all fighting over which was their favorite word. Um, no one won. They decided to put them all in the title. 
Um, and then there's an avoidance or an inhibition system. Um, so if you think about it, approach is about moving towards all those goodies, right? All the things that are delicious and wonderful and positive. And avoidance is about moving away from threats. So if there was a bear in the room, it would not be about your reward system. It'd be about your avoidance system. It'd be about getting away from bad things. If you were going to be shocked, it'd be about your avoidance system. Um, and to be sure, these overlap a little bit. There are moments where there's something that's good and bad, um, and they're both probably operating all the time, just at different levels, um, depending on what's in front of you. If you are contemplating a bear, the avoidance system is in full bore, going strong. If you're contemplating the million dollars three blocks away, it's the approach system is going to be overriding any other consideration of threats. And people think about these in a lot of different ways. And one of the ways they think about these is that there are strong individual differences um, in propensities towards these systems. Okay. Um, so my favorite cartoon character, can anyone guess what a reward person would think is the best cartoon character in the world? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, Tigger. I'm going to go with Tigger. Okay. Um, Tigger is all enthusiasm going after things. Um, and people like to think about if you have this underlying dimension of reward and approach, some people have that system in kind of more full tilt than others. Um, but it's also going to kind of change around situationally. So if you're in the wrong context, there's little reason to have that kind of approach system going full tilt. Um, so for example, if you th I'm a pretty high reward, high approach kind of person, but if you threw me in prison and all I had to look forward to was getting a cup of water every four hours, I wouldn't have a whole lot of joy and excitement. Um, but the idea is that when that system is going and you're doing well in moving towards rewards and goodies in life, then you're going to experience excitement and joy. Okay? This is a system that we think promotes not just happiness, but that high arousal, high energy kind of happiness. Um, but that when it's going badly and you're not getting a chance to have the love of your life or somebody else just ate the last chocolate right in front of your eyes, um, you might feel sadness or loss or even anger. Okay? Um, but if we talk about the threat and avoidance system, how you're doing on that system may drive different kinds of emotion states and in different kinds of emotion tendencies. So if you're doing really well in avoiding threats in life, so you didn't get your pink slip, you've escaped from the bear, um, and, and you've gotten away from all these kind of nagging threats, which you're going to likely feel is also a good sensation, but more of a phew, a relief, a calm. Okay, serenity, perhaps. And when you're doing badly in escaping from threats, then you're going to experience more anxiety and fear. Um, does that kind of heuristic make some sense? Um, so what we're going to be talking about is more of this kind of dimension of excitement and joy, or the failure to get excitement and joy leading to kind of a sense of sadness and loss. Um, so one way people think about this system is that there's this concept of reward responsiveness. So we vary as individuals, as human beings, in our level of how much we tend to respond to rewards. Um, some of us, it takes very little to have us kind of be very, very enthusiastic. How many of you know somebody that, you know, you're kind of amazed at their ability to feel joy over a small moment or a small goodie? All right. Now, how many of you know somebody who's just the opposite, that no matter what you dangled in front of them that seems pretty amazing, they're like, yeah, OK. They're pretty flat. It's hard to get a rise out of them. Okay. So there's self-report scales where you ask people questions about, OK, how reward responsive do you tend to be? Um, Chuck Carver, who's one of my really close collaborators, wrote probably the most well-used of these scales. And he just wrote out questions like, when I get something I want, I feel excited and energized. Or when you have an opportunity for something I like, I get excited right away. When good things happen to me, it affects me strongly. If you're curious about your own profile, you can go to Chuck Carver's website, download it, take it, and get your own score on are you reward responsive or not compared to other people, which is kind of fun. You can also find out if you have a high threat system. But 
most people now, I mean, there have been probably hundreds of studies on these kind of self-report scales, and now the big push in science is let's understanding the neural, let's get to the neural underpinnings, what's happening in the brain for the person who's having those kinds of responses. And it's pretty, thought, it's pretty well established that there are different parts of the brain involved in this system than would be involved in, say, sensory perceptions or other kind of key motor regions. Um, and the chase is on to understand these parts and how they work and how they work together, um, and then how the combination of those things might actually lead to something like joy. Like, what is firing off in your brain when you have this moment of joy? Okay, so two big regions you're going to hear about again and again and again tonight, um, sometimes called the VTA, um, this and the nucleus incumbens. So N accumbens, or you'll hear this abbreviated NAC, um, is kind of down here in the middle of the brain. Um, sometimes you'll hear people use the word striatum for that. That's the broader region that this is part of. And then the nucleus accumbens is getting messages from the ventral tegmental area, um, which is too much of a mouthful, so sometimes people call it ventral tegmentum. Sometimes they call it VTA. Neuroscientists seem to have a way of creating, creating an acronym for everything. So I'm going to say those now because um, I may slip into acronyms here, which is really bad. I'll try not to. but. So nucleus accumbens and VTA, so two big regions, but this is one way in which this is a cartoon. This is actually much more of a picture of what the reward system looks like, and we can come back to different pathways and um, aspects of this, but I want to start with some of the basic core regions, and then we can talk about how it gets more complex from there. Um, There are a lot of different brain regions involved in reward. We're going to talk about some of them today. Um, we won't kind of define all of these, but nucleus accumbens, ventral pallidum, ventral tegmental area, substantia nigra, all playing key roles. And then, um, so subcortical meaning below the cortex, and then cortex would be kind of the exterior kind of regions of your brain. You've got the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, anterior cingulate medial prefrontal cortex, and we'll point these out on pictures as we go through. All I want to say right now is there's a lot of pieces to this, and so I'm going to simplify, um, but we can come back to different, different aspects of this. There are also a lot of different neurotransmitters involved in this system. So how many of you guys have heard about dopamine? Oh man, okay, this is great. Um, how many of you have been reading anything about opioid neuropeptoids? Okay, all right. And hormones also play a critical role in this. And already tonight, somebody asked me a very savvy question about serotonin, which also plays into this system. And so layers and layers of brain regions and chemicals, and we'll talk about key features, and then we can come back to those that you're interested in hearing more about. Okay, so how did people get so fascinated by this. Probably one of the first studies that kicked off an amazing spurt of interest in this was by Olden Milner in 1954. And what they did is they inserted a wire into a rat's brain in such a way that if the rat pressed a lever, it could set off a, a sort of stimulation into that part of the brain. So the rat could trigger different regions of the brain. Um, and what they discovered, I mean, uh, you know, they experimented a lot with this kind of paradigm of self-stimulation, but what they discovered is that if they put a little probe down into the nucleus accumbens, the rat would begin to press the lever like crazy, okay, more than 2,000 times an hour. In fact, that rat would press the lever so many times that if they didn't kind of stop it, it wouldn't eat, it wouldn't drink, it would kill itself just pressing this lever. Um, so better than food or water, they figured they must have hit something pretty darn good here. Um, and you can actually watch videos. In the bizarre experiment, an electrode had been inserted into a specific part of a rat's brain. This was connected to a pedal that enabled the rat to stimulate its own brain. The rat could press the pedal continuously. Thousands of times enough. Nothing would stop it reaching that pit. Now, I will electrify the grid. The animal must cross an area that gives a very painful shock to the feet in order to get to the pedal and stimulate the brain. No hungry rat in our laboratory has ever been willing to take a shock. 
doctor largely says in order to get the food, they will die of starvation first. The scientists were amazed. They discovered the part of the rat's brain devoted to pleasure, a reward center. There was no stopping them now. Okay, so what we've learned since Olds and Milner. Okay, so this set off just a fury of research, right? I mean, how fascinating is that, that an animal would actually prefer that over food, water, you could shock it, it was unstoppable. Um, now, people look back on Olds and Milner and they sort of say, well, that was old school scientist, um, science, despite the amazing narration. I love the accent and the kind of like, it sounds like something just great out of a fabulous documentary. Um, and they say, well, okay, it doesn't really work like that. Look, the brain is much, much more complex. There's a lot of pathways. There's a lot of regions that was oversimplified. But it certainly spurred a lot of interest. And, and, and so, yes, psychology of reward is complex. Um, and there's a lot of pieces. But now the question is, okay, what are those pieces? How do you break it down? How do you disassemble it? And... Um, the other thing I want to just say up front is that it now looks like almost all of these pieces have both conscious parts. So whatever the part of the reward system that's firing off, you probably have some awareness of it, but there's also ways in which it can operate outside of our awareness. Not unconscious in a deep, dark Freudian way, but unconscious in that your brain just takes care of it automatically without you having to kind of consciously chew on things and keep it in your mind's eye. There's a lot that happens swiftly, naturally, without kind of an obsessional kind of stare at it and hammer over it. So what do you have to do when you're thinking about going after a reward? Well, one of the first things you need to do is that you need to learn to recognize a cue for reward. Okay, um, and then you have to mobilize and go after that reward. And then you have to, or you don't have to, actually, and some people don't, but you hope that you savor that reward. And so people have started to say, okay, how do you look at these kind of separable pieces like this? Um, and in doing that, they put a lot of focus on dopamine and on the VTA, or ventral tegmental area nucleus accumbens, and then um, this region of your cortex right up here in the front called prefrontal cortex. It's a silly name because there is no before the front. Um, <laughs> it is the front of your brain, but for whatever reason, it's been dubbed prefrontal. Um, um, now, the, ve the ventral tegmental is uh, largely sending signals to the nucleus that comes through dopamine neurotransmitters and neurotransmitter and, and also to the PFCs through dopamine. So that's part of why people talk so much about dopamine in this system. So let's, let's backtrack a little bit. How many of you are familiar with kind of neurons and neurotransmitters? Okay, fabulous. All right, so I put a picture of a neuron up here just in case. Um, so these are the brain cells. Um, and um, as the brain cell fires, the signal comes down here to the um, terminal buttons, which are storing neurotransmitters. And here's um, a close-up of that kind of end of the neurotransmitter. So here's a button. And inside that button, there are vesicles that are carrying um, little capsules of the neurotransmitters. And when, they, when the neuron fires, this is released into this cleft. And the chemical carries across the cleft to the receptor. Um, any given neuron may have more than one kind of receptor, but if this dopamine's released, it should fit like a kind of key into a lock into this dopamine receptor. And then that starts, if there's enough dopamine received, that starts the signaling of this next neuron. Um, so the neurons we're talking about largely involve dopamine. And I'm going to talk about a lot of different neuro, uh, neuroscience kinds of paradigms tonight. And some of it will be animal, some of it will be human. But one of the things that animal studies have allowed us to do is tap into specific cells in the brain and measure their activity. And then say, when do those specific neurons fire off? When are they going? And so that's a paradigm called single cell recording. Um, so you're inserting a small probe to record activity in a specific region. So we can do things like put a probe down into the nucleus accumbens and ask when do different, even different parts of the nucleus accumbens fire. Um, and you can put the animal through all kinds of different kind of tasks and see when you get the strongest firing. 
So let's break this up a little bit. I'm going to start with the ventral tegmentum. And I'm going to start with something that actually was modeled after Pavlov's original studies where he had trained a dog to salivate to a bell, if you guys remember those kinds of classical conditionings. So if that's, a, that's an amazing kind of reward learning paradigm that's influenced science even to this day because what you're doing is you're teaching an animal that something is a signal for reward. So remember what Pavlov did, he rang a bell before he gave the dog food. The dogs gradually began to associate the, the bell with food so strongly they would salivate anytime they heard the bell. Okay, if you have pets, you're probably used to them kind of doing this as soon as they see the can opener or whatever your you know, kind of food cue is. Um, Wolfram Schultz used this with monkeys, and what he was do interested in is what happens as the animal's learning that this neutral cue is a signal that a reward's about to happen. And, and where would we see that happening in the brain? Where does the animal learn that reward is about to happen? And it can seem kind of cold and dry, but think about it. Every day of your life, you need to be able to kind of judge behind door number one, two, or three. Is it going to be more rewarding? Which person in this room do I want to most talk to? Who's going to be the most fun? Which thing do I want to learn about? What's going to be juiciest here? Which book do I want to choose at the library? You're thinking about all these things that on the face of it seem a little neutral, but you've learned, nope, that one's a good predictor of what's going to be rewarding. Now, so what sets the VTA off, the ventral tegmentum? This is interesting. When you are first pairing the kind of cue with the reward, the VTA fires off only as you're learning about a new cue. Okay? When that cue is a new cue signaling to learn about reward in that early process, you get a lot of firing. Um, and so the firing is kind of initially associated closer and cl closer to the reward, but as you're learning more, the cue itself will fire off the VTA. Um, and then if you stop, if the cue stops being predictive, the VTA activity stops. And so it's got this really exquisite relationship of getting transferred from the reward back to the cue. And so it seems to be chasing kind of what's a signal that something's about to be rewarding. And so with research like that, people have begun to think that the VTA's role seems to be in helping you learn to, to recognize a new unexpected reward is going to happen when I see or get this cue. Okay, It's signaling for you, go down that path. That was good last time. Turn left. <laughs> Talk to that person. They're, they're kind of helping you. This system is helping you learn that's a good option to pick. Um, and it continues to help fire when that cue has predicted reward in the past. Um, so it's a learning system, a reward learning system. And now there are probably hundreds and hundreds of studies being done on reward learning and, and the kind of temporal contingencies, the timing, the kind of parameters that influence how well reward learning happens. But let's say now you've started to learn that a cue means reward. So if you're a Pavlov's dog, you hear the bell, and you're thinking, oh, food, and you're salivating. But OK, the VTA is going to fire off. It's got this kind of learned message that this is a signal for reward. But then what happens? That's hardly going to get you there, right? I mean, so yes, part of your brain fires. Where does it go from there? Um, and the VTA sends a huge amount of its signal downstream to the nucleus accumbens, this NAC. Um, so let's talk about what the NAC seems to do. Um, and actually, I should highlight, the VTA is pretty hard to pick up on in imaging studies, so a lot more of the human imaging studies focus on the NAC. We have an easier time finding it in the signals. So human imaging of the NAC, usually what people are using is functional magnetic resonance imaging, or what we call fMRI. Um, uh, this is a picture of an fMRI, so you would lie down and, and you would be uh, shuttled into this machine on the tray. Um, and it's actually a magnet. It's a large magnet, and what it's measuring um, is blood flow in the brain. And the reason it's able to pick up on blood flow is it's measuring oxygen-rich versus oxygen-poor blood um, because uh, of the kind of uh, hemoglobin. So 
why would blow fill matter? Well, when your brain fires off in a given region, it expends its resources and it needs new blood flow in. Okay, it needs to be replenished. And so what we're really measuring is which regions need to be replenished. Okay, um, and when they're getting more blood, it's a signal that, okay, you've been using that part of the brain, okay? And what we're looking at is changes across conditions and how much blood flows to different regions of the brain. So it's not actually as exact as it seems. I'm gonna show you lots and lots of pretty pictures that make it look like, aha, that's the neuron firing off. It's actually not quite that precise. You know, there's a range of error because it's you know, blood flow to a specific area. Um, um, but fMRI has been a pretty amazing tool. So I brought some pictures here. This is during a visual task. Um, we know that a lot of your visual processing is happening back here in the occipital lobe. And if we show you pictures and ask you to kind of focus on those pictures, we're going to get greater activations in the occipital cortex. So you get these beautiful kind of graphs of the region that seems most busy during that period. Um, you have huge motor regions, and if we ask you to do something like process a motor sensation or plan a motor activity, we're going to get activation there um, compared to a neutral baseline. Um, pretty nifty. So we can use that same kind of paradigm to look at, well, what part of the brain is busy when we ask you to imagine a reward happening, or we'd say to you, hey, you're about to get a reward, okay? So the nucleus accumbens, which is the largest recipient of, of dopamine in the brain, does lots of things. So uh, Helen Fisher, a few years ago, got huge amounts of press because she'd found the love center in the brain. You guys remember reading anything about this? So your nucleus accumbens lights up. If we put you in that scanner, put you inside the tube, and show you a picture of somebody you love, your nucleus accumbens is going to light up. Okay, Pretty nifty. Um, so Helen Fisher got written up in vogue for the love center. But it turns out that um, the nucleus accumbens does much, much more than that. And even the things I'm going to talk about today aren't even the beginning of the list. Your nucleus accumbens is a really, really busy center in your brain. It fires off to lots of stuff. But if you show moms pictures of their babies, the nucleus accumbens fires off. Um, if we show you sexy pictures, your nucleus accumbens is going to light up. That's actually a really good way of getting the nucleus accumbens to light up. And an interesting thing about this is men will say, oh, yeah, that was sexy. Women will say, no, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't so good for me. But their nucleus accumbens fires up just as much as men's does. Um, this got a lot of press about a year or two ago. Revenge lights up your nucleus accumbens. Um, so somebody does you wrong and you say, now you have a chance to pay them back. Same region as eating chocolate. <laughs> um, so the nucleus accumbens seems like it's really responsive to reward. Now we can talk later too about other things that fire off your nucleus accumbens, but this is some pretty good evidence that it's doing something when there's a chance and opportunity for future reward. So the VTA sort of fires off the signal and says, oh, you learned this in the past, that was good, that was yummy, and nucleus accumbens goes, oh yeah, I'm coming online. But okay, it's coming online, it's getting blood flow, but what the heck is it doing, right? Um, it's activating to rewards or cues of potential reward, but what does that allow us to do? What's the downstream kind of consequence of that? Um, so what if it's firing off? At some level, it's helping us process rewards, but even that feels kind of vague and circular. So what else correlates with it is a kind of key question. Um, so it's lighting up, so what? Um, you know, fMRI is fascinating because you always see some part of the brain light up and you kind of go, oh my gosh, look at that, it's a finding, um, because it looks pretty, because there's always some part of your brain lighting up. <laughs> um, so what behaviors or thoughts or emotions happen when the nucleus accumbens is going strong? And animal studies have actually helped us there again. Um, in some ways, we get better kind of traction. Um, now, I'm going to talk some about animal studies where we're manipulating parts of the reward system. So we can kind of put probes down into the nucleus accumbens and intensify its activity. We can um, drip dopamine into that system and have the system kind of come online more strongly and watch what changes in the animal's behavior. We can't do that with humans. Um, 
So Salamone is one of my major heroes in this kind of set of paradigms. And Salamone um, has done a lot of different testing and kind of said, really spent years trying to treat, well, what's the behavior that seems most correlated with when you bring this nucleus accumbens online? And he does a lot of testing of very hungry rats. Um, and what he finds is that no matter whether the nucleus accumbens is on or not, if the food is easy to get to, the rat will eat it. And if all things being equal, there's sugar versus some yucky rat chow, they'll eat the sugar time and again, okay? The difference in the nucleus accumbens isn't whether they like sugar, whether they'll eat food when they're hungry. It's about how hard will they work for better food, okay? Um, so these tasks are called effort for reward. Um, and usually it comes down to, look, you could have the rat chow if you don't want to move. But if you're willing to work harder, you could have a really high sucrose rat dessert. Okay? Um, and what dopamine in the nucleus accumbens seems to do is tune up how hard you're willing to work for the rat dessert. Um, and if you block dopamine in the nucleus accumbens, so you give something like haloperidol, which blocks the kind of receptors there, um, they will stop being as willing to work for the reward. And there's two kinds of paradigms they use for this. One is they'll see how many lever presses a rat will do to get a little bit better food. And the other is they look at kind of how steep of a ramp the rat will run up. So, um, you know, an, an animal with an incredibly high level of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens would run up a very steep ramp to get to the better reward. Um, and an animal with a really low level of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens would be like, oh, whatever. Uh, I want to be the couch potato. Give me the rat chow. Um, I know that food up there, it's really, really good, but that's a steep ramp. Um, so uh, this is just a graphic from this person, Treadway, who's written really nice articles about this. How much effort, you'll, how much effort, how much of a barrier you'd scale to get the larger reward versus the ch with the smaller reward is kind of what it seems like the nucleus accumbens is doing. And so in this way, people are fascinated by this region because it seems so key to motivation. Because think back to the example I gave of, okay, there's, a, there's millions of dollars down the street. What you were all talking about is running. Okay? And think about it. That's, I mean, it's a willingness to put in effort and energy. And that's this kind of central function that people think the nucleus accumbens is helping to kind of mobilize. So if you want to be able to kind of expend a lot of effort and energy and motivation to go after these kind of dreams and hopes, what you really want then is your knack to come on full tilt, full of dopamine, roaring. Um, and that would give you a higher willingness to expend energy and effort. Um, so it wouldn't be the question of would you like chocolate more or less. It wouldn't be the question of which would you prefer. It would be which one would you work harder for. Uh, how hard would you work for the extra goodie? Does that make sense? Um, and they do lots of different studies of kind of different kinds of behavioral paradigms where they're depleting dopamine or increasing dopamine and they're looking at rates of lever pressing or delays in lever pressing to see what will the animal tolerate to get to the kind of better food. Boy, that doesn't sound like much fun, though, if you think about it, right? We're all talking about work. How hard would you, what, what, what kind of ramp would you run up? That does not sound like joy, right? So somehow psychologists get their hands on something, and before you know it, the whole reward and joy system is sounding like, well, how, how, how much would you climb a mountain to get where you want to go? Um, there's got to be something better than that, right? I mean, this is you know supposed to be your joy system, maybe? So. We've talked a little bit about learning, that you're learning to kind of predict where are going to be the good rewards and what's your experience of rewards. We've talked a little bit about mobilizing energy and effort. Um, and so people talk about that as wanting the reward or desiring the reward, is your, and your index of that would be, OK, how much energy would you spend for it? But there's also then this business of liking your reward. So um, one of the key thinkers in this field is somebody named Barrage. And Barrage has done this great job of sort of saying, there's learning, there's wanting, and there's liking. And those may not go hand in hand, which is this really puzzling thing. And we'll talk about when those maybe don't fit well together. Um, but liking would be, OK, now you have the chocolate. You ran up the mountain to get it. And do you savor it? Do you enjoy it? 
does it give you bliss, the kind of hedonic quality of achieving these rewards? Okay, and that turns out not to be um, orchestrated by quite the same system. So it's different parts of the nucleus accumbens involved, but they're parts of the nucleus accumbens that are triggered by your own internal opioids. Okay. So if you think about some of the steps in the process, and this is still kind of a cartoon image. There's a lot more to it than this. You've got to learn to recognize a cue for reward, mobilize and go after that reward, and then hopefully like that reward and sit around and enjoy it and savor it. Three different, very different pieces, different parts of kind of the brain firing off to support those. But then you have to think, okay, would I go after it more? And, you know, we like to think that reward, once rewarded, we're going to just keep chasing the reward, right? Like, why wouldn't you go after more chocolate? Why wouldn't you go after more of this? But, in fact, that's not really a very adaptive evolutionary strategy because what happens while you're finishing off that box of chocolate is other opportunities come and go. Um, other threats may come in the room. Um, and so you need to be able to kind of juggle the pursuit of any one reward against the possibility of other kind of goal constraints and other kinds of opportunities lost and other kinds of threats. And how do you, how do you juggle that kind of more complex multitasking? Um, so yeah, tasted good. Why not bury yourself in that? Well, okay, you have to kind of pause and think, well, what are the costs of pursuing this even more? Um, or otherwise, wouldn't we all just be sitting around eating chocolate, listening to music, and doing other hedonic activities all darn day long, right? Something stops us. Um, so you usually have to pay something, and that's the problem, right? So it's not cost-free to stick with any one reward, and so we have to kind of think about what are those costs. And costs come in a lot of forms. You might have to spend energy to get what you want. You might have to spend time. You might have to endure threats, shocks, punishments, risks, loss. And so somewhere you need a calculator that sort of says, okay, relative weight of all these different kind of potentials. Um, and, and a good goal regulator, a person who's good at balancing life's pros and cons, is attending to all of that pretty fluidly and pretty automatically. And to do that, you got your prefrontal cortex, where kind of the larger kind of calculations are coming into play. And there's a huge amount of research here, too, on the cost of reward and what people are thinking about is decision making. Um, so weighing, um, I'll pers continuing to pursue one reward path versus another or discontinuing that action. It's an exploding area of science, um, lots and lots of stuff, where people are manipulating, OK, you know there's this reward out there, so how much would you risk? How much pain would you tolerate? How much delay could you endure? all in the hopes of gaining a reward. So how do different people do those kind of calculations? Um, and what influences how they do those calculations? I'm going to give you a quick snapshot. Um, one of the things that people have done a lot of work on is how much time would you wait for a reward? So they call this delay of gratification. Um, think about your investment plan. Okay, you willing to wait and let it grow, or are you gonna take all the money and go ahead and spend it on the goodie? You know, and people really vary on how much they're kind of savers versus spenders. Um, and so people have their own delay of gratification profile. And one of the ways that Walter Michel first started testing this was he said to kids, um, look, you have a choice. You can have one cookie now, or if you wait, you can have two cookies later. Okay, have you guys seen these paradigms? Okay, um, so waiting usually involves a bit of the prefrontal cortex because if you're a kid and you're kind of trying to decide whether to eat the cookie or the goodie that's right in front of you, it takes some kind of strategy. Um, so just to show you a little bit of a clip from this. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Anyone know the good strategy for a kid to take? It's a matter of minutes. It depends on the age group. Um, so as they get older, you know, the task gets a little more challenging. Um, but a good strategy is actually to distract yourself, um, which takes, you know, kind of thinking up, kind of get away from the thing that you're staring at and go do something else. Um, and, you know, as adults, we do that pretty fluidly. We're used to the drill. Um, but kids really vary in whether they can kind of think up that kind of strategy. Um, so. Um, and the ability to think up those strategies and to kind of remind yourself of the threats and the kind of promise is PFC. That's prefrontal cortex in action for you. Um, and so um, that part of the brain, huge, huge role in kind of how effectively you do in managing strategies for pursuing your goals and avoiding threats and balancing it all out. And we can talk more about the different calculators in your PFC, but um, it's a huge part of this. So um, the PFC, prefrontal cortex, is actually a whole set of regions. Um, um, regions that are getting a whole lot of attention are orbital frontal and insula and medial prefrontal, cingulate cortices, and people are studying how these different pieces work together. Um, but we know that they're coding kind of for your appraisal and your experience and your memory and kind of bringing these pieces together along with the costs and likelihoods. Um, so your estimates of, okay, would it come true and how much would it cost me in terms of time, energy, patience, all that sort of stuff. Without it, you want a nice prefrontal cortex. Okay. so. You know, even at a kind of snapshot level, we're talking about a lot of different functions when we start to talk about the reward system. And that's why people use the word system, because there's a lot of pieces to the effective pursuit of rewards, and there's a lot of parts of the brain that seem to be involved. So learning about the potential cues for reward, mobilizing your effort and motivation, considering the costs and risks of reward pursuit, and savoring and enjoying those rewards would be kind of functions that most people would think you could pick apart a bit. Sure, they're all going to play a role in the kind of symphony of how it goes together, but they're different functions that we can pull apart, and we're beginning to see um, that they seem to map onto activity in different regions to some extent. Now, that's a simplification because this is a circuit. So when the VTA, or the ventral tegmental area, fires off, the nucleus accumbens fires off, the prefrontal cortex fires off, and guess what? It sends signals back down to the nucleus accumbens and ventral tegmental area. So it's like a giant cycle that's going on every second. You know, it's a feedback loop um, working in concert. Now, we haven't even begun to think about things, though, like, well, why do certain people get driven by certain rewards and other people by other rewards? And that's also this really fascinating area of research. And by far, we don't know anywhere near as we would hope to with this, because think about human beings and how many different rewards we go after. But there's some really, really interesting work on this front. So for example, um, it turns out that you can ingest oxytocin, um, and there are experimenters who are doing that with humans. It's a hormone that seems to play a major role in kind of social pair bonding. And if you are treated with oxytocin, then the amount that your nucleus accumbens is going to kind of come online for social stimuli, like pictures of faces, is magnified. So oxytocin seems to have some role in magnifying the value of social rewards and social connectivity. Now it's much more complex than that because it doesn't intensify the reward value of all social cues, but certain social cues it seems to work with, which is kind of fascinating. Testosterone. Testosterone, I mean, it's throughout your body. It also plays a role in different brain regions. But there are testosterone influences straight into the nucleus accumbens. Um, and it turns out that um, your testosterone system um, is turned up, like the level of testosterone that you're releasing is turned up when you win a contest with another human, whether it's a chess match or a tennis match. Um, and that that then amplifies activity in the nucleus accumbens. 
Um, but it also turns out that people who have high testosterone levels tend to value the kind of reward of obtaining power more. So people are doing all kinds of work on that, which I find really, really interesting. Um, and then there's a hormone called orexin, which seems to play a critical role in appetite. Um, and again, seems to amplify kind of appetite for food. So um, these are kind of cartoon simplifications, but there are ways that people are beginning to chase a little bit about, okay, well, why would one reward end up being more powerful than another? And where would some of the individual differences in that begin to start? Um, because there are really powerful individual differences. I mean, think for a minute about, you know, the people in your family, the people in your friendship circle, and where they stand on kind of how much energy they put towards goals, how much they savor different goals, um, what are their favorite goals. We're all really pretty varied on that front. Um, and there are a lot of different factors that go into shaping how the reward system functions, and there are a lot of people studying this, but one actually is age, and you're not gonna like what I have to say here. Um, <laughs> uh, your dopamine function declines slightly, just slightly, but it declines as you get older. Now, you already knew that. Think about how much joy a kid can get from jumping up and down on a tree trunk. You know, I was in a park a couple weeks ago, and there was a kid singing out loud with joy over just jumping, you know? I haven't done that in a while. Um, <laughs> it looked tempting, but it couldn't, couldn't mobilize it. Um, and so age is a big part of this. Um, and it's not just dopamine function that's changing. Um, there's more and more evidence that your prefrontal cortex doesn't fully mature um, it, into, until well into your 20s. Okay, so now you have this system that's kind of calculating risk in the middle of the reward pursuit, and it's not as refined, okay? And so there are a lot of people studying sensation seeking and risk taking in adolescence when they're in high reward contexts as challenges, and thinking about that as challenges to the prefrontal cortex, um, and all kinds of fascinating research coming out there that we could talk about. Stress, you want to kind of dampen down your reward system? Well, stress will do it for you. Um, if you are, short-term stress may not do this so much. Actually, short-term stress may have sometimes very different effects, but chronic, long-term severe stress seems to turn down the volume of your nucleus accumbens, okay? So do bad moods for that matter, and good moods turn up the activity a little bit. Um, so let's go back to the knack for a minute in the context of thinking about individual differences. We've talked about its mobilizing effort, willingness to expend effort to obtain desired rewards. And imagine for a minute that people are really different on this. You know, that your baseline kind of how easily that system is kind of amplified and turned on differs a lot between individuals. What might that mean for what behaviors look like across individuals? What would it mean to have a weak reward system or a weak knack? So it'd be harder to feel motivated to go after something, to spend the effort and the energy for something. And a lot of people think that this is a big piece of what's happening with depression, okay? With clinical depression, there's a kind of, uh, yeah, it could be good, but I don't know. I don't really feel like getting out of bed. I don't really feel like kind of chasing that. Um, and so you can show this in kind of laboratory experimental tasks that it's harder for people to mobilize effort and energy towards a reward. Um, and you can also show that there's um, interactions between genes and environmental exper experience that it may be contributing to lower dopamine function in depression. But it's not the case that all parts of the reward system are broken, and this is what starts to fascinate me. So if you take a depressed person and you put them into a middle of a situation that's a good situation, they'll enjoy it more than they anticipated that they would. If you say to them beforehand, tell me if this is gonna be good and if you wanna work toward it, uh, I, don't, I don't think it's gonna be that good and I'm, I'm not gonna, I, I don't think I have the energy for that. And they will really feel that they don't have the energy for it because their nucleus accumbens is not doing as well a lot of times. But then put them in that context and the hedonic kind of pathway, the kind of liking system actually functions much better than they thought it would. So a disjuncture between the motivational and the liking system seems like it may be at play here, yeah. Then 
That's this fascinating thing. So that requires nucleus accumbens to get the energy, right? So even a learn, so the learning seems like it's intact at some level, but the motivational system. So yeah, it was good last time you did it. You learn that, you think you're okay. And yet it feels like all too steep of a ramp. Um, and so the depressed person will often say to their therapist, I, you know, I hear you, but that's just too much effort. That's too much energy. I don't think I can do it. I don't feel like I got that in me. And, and if that's a specific motivational deficit, it helps explain kind of the psychology of well, why is it so darn hard for them to mobilize. Um, maybe the knack, and a lot of people trying to study this. Um, what's interesting is that there's now one of the more effective cognitive behavioral therapies, this behavioral activation therapy, that involves structuring things so that people don't have to rely on their internal motivation to go after rewards. So you go ahead and get it on a calendar, make it attainable, put the supports in place so that people can kind of keep tackling small rewarding activities that they wouldn't go after if they had to kind of mobilize their nucleus accumbens in their own motivation system. And get them in that context, get them in that rhythm, and it's got a profound effect in helping people get over depressive symptoms. It's kind of nifty because it's a very simple kind of, um, kind of switch that seems to be working. Um, it's hard to do. It's hard to kind of counteract the motivational deficit, but if they can do it and if you can give them enough structure to work through it, a lot of people experience significant improvement in their clinical depression take some skill on the individual's part and the therapist's part. I don't want to downplay that part. One yeah. The problem is that a lot of our drugs are muddy. So we might amplify dopamine in many different regions of the brain. And so that wouldn't be maybe what you want to do because dopamine is actually distributed throughout your brain and there's a lot of the after effects of kind of amplifying dopamine that you might not want. So it's, it's hard for us right now to kind of just target, okay, bam, we're going to hit that region with that drug. Yeah, I mean, that's the big hunt, is to find things that tap into kind of more specific regions and receptors and things like that, but that's really hard um, for a lot of different reasons. Okay, so let's talk about the flip side. So now we're all thinking, okay, I don't want to have that. I don't want to have that experience. What if I had a really super powerful nucleus accumbens? Would I give me more energy? I'd be the person out there who was charismatically fighting for every dream and hope, and I'd have boundless amounts of energy, and I'd inspire other people to join me in the pack, and we'd all kind of go conquer the world. Um, and certainly, you know, it'd be nice to have that enthusiasm and vigor. And a lot of people think that that's one of the things that's really involved in extroversion. So a scientist named Depew is written a lot about how that might be at the root of extroversion. Um, think about what extroversion is. Everything um, interpersonal seems super juicy. Oh, I'm going to love being at that party. There's going to be 13, 15, 16 people that I can talk to, and who knows what will unfold. Maybe they'll be dancing. And for the rest of us, or people like me who are kind of you know, more withdrawn, that's not the first thing that's rolling through my head. <laughs> um, so some people think that extroversion is a kind of form of reward sensitivity where the interpersonal rewards just feel magnified and they feel kind of um, terrific. But on the darker side, I study mania. And I, you know, I'm part of a small group of scientists who think that this has a role to explaining mania. Um, that people with bipolar disorder will say, yeah, I respond more intensely than other people do to rewards. I get more excited than other people do. I get more mobilized. And you can show in a lab, if you're giving people a chance to earn a reward, people with bipolar disorder will actually work harder for it than other people will, um, which may have something to do with why we see such incredible accomplishments in their family members. Um, and it seems like they'll always do that. It doesn't take being symptomatic. So people with mania, the mania comes and goes. And even during their well periods, they'll work pretty hard for a reward that's hard. Um, but that kind of willingness to get really, really mobilized for rewards, people who say, um, who have this in their family history and who are showing mild symptoms already, that that reward sensitivity, there's early, early evidence that it, it's one of the things that helps us predict who's going who's to develop more severe symptoms over time. 
And um, we also have some evidence that dopamine systems are dysfunctional or, you know, are dysregulated in mania. And that parts of the brain, like the nucleus accumbens, seem to be structurally a little bit different. Um, what about addictions? Okay. Um, think about what cocaine does. Cocaine stimulants, they are releasing um, dopamine into the cleft. Okay. Um, when you take a stimulant or a cocaine, if you were to do that, it's going to really give a huge surge. Um, and there's going to be a huge surge of dopamine in the, do do in the um, nucleus accumbens that's going to outweigh anything that we get natural real life rewards. It's a huge jolt. Okay. Other rewards, yeah, you're going to get a little bit of a activation there. Um, and what's interesting is that some people seem to be primed to be particularly responsive to that, and other people also seem like they're, there's now some evidence that for people with addictions, the kind of responsivity of the nucleus accumbens to um, everyday life rewards is a little flatter. Okay, So now you have a way of jump-starting that system and giving it a huge jolt, and it feels great, and it's not something that you're being able to do as effectively in day-to-day -day life. Okay, so the differential between the drugs and the everyday life may be larger in what it feels like. Alcohol abuse. Howard Fields here at UCSF just in the last few weeks had a great finding that got written up in the New York Times and all kinds of media outlets that people who are susceptible to alcohol abuse look like they have a dysregulation of some of the opioid recep receptors that are involved in the reward system. So it may change a little bit about what alcohol feels like and, and the contrast for that. The other thing that people are really studying in the addictions is that wanting is not the same thing as liking. So we, if you think about what people with addictions will do, they'll, do, they'll spend a lot of energy to go after the drug of their choice. Um, but we all know people who are not happy drunks. And that's always a bit of a puzzle, right? Like so much energy going into drinking or drugs, and then at the same time, the person doesn't look like they're actually having such a huge high anymore. And so people are studying kind of what happens with wanting systems, what happens with habit establishment, and is that there at the same time a kind of deadening of the liking system so to these kind of um, drugs and chemicals, so that there's a disjuncture between what the person is chasing and then how much they're enjoying it. What about other kind of natural addictions? So, or uh, you know, addictions to things other than substances, um, gambling, eating problems, lots and lots of work on the reward pathways with many different conditions. So, just backing up to recap for a minute, um, if you think about some of the best things in life, they really involve rewards. So, some of our biggest rewards, our joys, our dreams, I mean, those are things that are kind of the essence of what we talk about when we talk about what is the meaning in our lives. You're usually going to hear people talking about those kinds of themes. And whether we like this at a philosophical level or not, those are probably somewhat shaped by our brain systems, um, what we find intrinsically naturally appealing and how we pursue those dreams. Um, and if you really step back for a minute and thought about the kinds of steps you've had to do to pursue your life dreams and rewards, you know how much complexity and effort and focus and cognitive resource it took. And it's sort of a small masterpiece that your brain mobilizes all those different processes to make that happen. It's really no small wonder that sometimes we hit barriers um, in those pursuits. Um, and so the trick, I think, of what neuroscience may help us learn more about is how those systems are balanced and regulated so that we kind of most successfully pursue those dreams and, and hopes and goals and weigh the kind of probable costs at the same time. So it's all, I think, about balance in the brain. Um, and the question in the mental illnesses and psychological disorders is about where we see imbalances or dysregulations and in which systems and what that tells us about which processes and which moments are going to be most vulnerable for people with those um, conditions. Um, so how do these different pieces become dysregulated and what does it look like when they are dysregulated I think is really this fascinating puzzle that I'm sure we're going to be working on for the next five, ten years longer. Um, but I find it just a fascinating one. So I'm happy to answer questions about any of this. Um, that was my kind of brief detour and now we'll, we'll take the kind of heart of what you guys want to hear about.
Yeah. I think so. Okay, so the question is, okay, we already, a lot of this is already implemented in different self-help books. A lot of people already are, are implementing fixes for this. So where is the future? And I think the future is a better understanding of where, how, when it breaks down and what strategies effectively compensate for when it breaks down. I think we're still fairly imprecise about where, how, when it breaks down. Um, I don't, you know, 10 years when I started this, everybody talked about bipolar disorder just being elevated reward sensitivity. I don't think there is such a thing. I don't think that we have global elevations of reward of every kind, that we're, we're mesmerized by every kind of reward, and we learn cues more quickly, and we're always motivated, and we're always savoring. No, I, I, you know, I think now we're getting to this idea of, okay, no, wait a minute. There's got to be parts and processes that break down, and let's figure out what conditions trigger that, and then if, it's, if a part of it's being dysregulated, what would be an effective strategy? And so I think we could get much, much more precise, and it would really help people know kind of, okay, what are triggers for me, and how do I modulate those in a much, much more powerful way? Um, uh, let's see, and the brown shirt, yes. Beautiful. Uh, that's a beautiful question. I'm not going to do it justice in the recap, but the question is, how do you think about the reward system cross-culturally if you hear about places like Denmark where happiness is really high? Um, and what role does advertising perhaps play in those kind of cultural differences? There are huge cultural differences, and I'm only going to begin to touch on those. But one way that people think about this is um, they kind of try and classify more individualistic versus collectivistic societies. And in individualistic societies, like the U.S., um, we have a kind of um, background philosophy that uh, influences us to believe that our individual accomplishments are a very, very important part of our kind of life goals and that how well we're doing and pursuing our own individual accomplishment is a big part of it. In other cultures, um, actually standing out from the pack as an individual driving your own achievement forward might not be seen as the most positive thing and that what might be more important is to be fluidly adapted to your pack. Um, and attune to signals from them, um, and perhaps not doing things to make everybody jealous and envious of you, <laughs> so that um, you would kind of keep some of those instincts a little bit modulated in support of kind of more interpersonal connectedness as a primary value. Um, I think that actually has a huge role in kind of shaping the goals people pursue. I also think that media and um, advertising um, frequently give us images of unattainable goals. Um, so we are exposed every day to images of people who have much, much more than we do. We have more than most people in the world, and yet we're always seeing images of people who have more. And it keeps the bar here um, so that I think we're a little bit more likely to keep pedaling um, and not get the chance to kind of savor um, because we're never going to get there um, because the image is up here. So, uh, yeah. Absolutely. So two different ways that we know that that works, and there's probably a myriad of others. So the question is, are there, um, um, beyond the cues that signal reward, are there other kinds of cues that might turn um, the reward system activity down? We know that chronic stress diminishes activation of the nucleus accumbens, so that's pretty fascinating, because that's certainly, you know, kind of, okay, that's one hard knock way that that's going to happen. But there's also kind of second by second stuff that happens to turn down activity in the nucleus accumbens. And so um, there's a paradigm called um, uh, response reversal where we train you that, OK, press this button, press this button. It's good, 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 good. Now the button stops working. No more chocolate for pressing that button, okay? It's a response reversal paradigm. Um, and uh, people look at kind of omission of reward and how quickly you learn about omission of reward and learn to kind of quit pressing that button. Um, and they do it in animals, they also do it in humans. And what they can show you is that regions of the prefrontal cortex, particularly like the orbital frontal cortex, help you kind of notice quickly, ooh, that's not working anymore, um, and stop. Um, orbital frontal cortex sends an inhibitory signal down to the nucleus accumbens saying, 
not so good anymore, time to reverse course. And there are people who um, don't seem to have any, people really vary in how quickly um, they learn on those kinds of lab tasks that, you know what, doing that isn't gonna work anymore. And it seems super, super easy to learn that because you think, well, wait, I was pressing the button, it was good, it was good, it was good, the minute it stops, come on, I see it. So, but what we do to make those tasks harder is that we don't always give the reward. Um, because in real life, there's rarely anything you do that works 100% of the time. So you set up tasks, and like 70% of the time you get a reward, and 30% of the time you don't. Um, it's called probabilistic reward. And in that kind of paradigm where the reward's kind of mostly there, sometimes not, mostly there, it's harder to notice when it stops being a good thing to do. Um, so they use probabilistic reward, and then they kind of reverse, kind of, is this a good thing to do? Take away the kind of reward and watch how quickly people learn. And huge individual differences, very driven by the prefrontal cortex. And we know something of the pathways that then kind of send a signal back down to the nucleus accumbens. So, um, yeah, I've been ignoring this side of the room. Let me come over there. <laughs> That's a great question. So it's unclear in some ways. I mean, so um, it does look like in animal studies, sometimes it looks to be a precursor for addictions. But the other thing that's going to happen, your brain is an amazing, amazing um, organ. And so what happens is that if a part of the brain is firing off excessively, then um, modulation is going to happen. You know, so if a neuron is firing almost continuously, it'll turn down how easily its receptors, you know, how easily it's activated. Um, so think about what happens with a, with a kind of stimulant hit. You know, if you're continuously kind of hitting the brain with stimulants and you're flooding dopamine receptors, um, those neurons are going to say, wow, something's wrong. I'm firing way too often. And they're going to kind of pull back on how many... Um, receptors they have so that they're going to be much harder to fire off. So there is a kind of after effect of the kind of stimulants in the cocaine that tunes down activity in that system. Um, so it may be a little bit of a both. It may be that it can set the stage for addictions, but once the addiction kicks in, it may kind of make the cycle worse. And we're not really sure how long it takes for that process to restore to kind of baseline levels. So it's a great question. Uh, yeah. Okay, so the question is how much the genes uh, influence? Probably a lot, and there's a lot of research going on. So, for example, we've identified a lot of different genes that influence dopamine function. Um, and people are trying to understand then how those kind of play out in influencing. Um, so there are studies where they'll look at kind of specific polymorphisms of a of a given dopamine gene, and they'll look to see how that influences nucleus accumbens activity in the context of reward. The findings are still a little bit mixed, um, and part of that, I think, has to do with these systems are so hugely influenced by life experience as well. Um, and so on the one hand, we know that there's huge genetic influences. On the other hand, we're going to have to kind of find ways to map the genes by the environment to get to kind of OK. And then for a given person, why is their nucleus accumbens kind of lighting up at a given moment? But that's, um, that work is definitely going on and very promising. So. Okay, um, so the question is, are there protocols that are standardized for delivering something like behavioral activation? Um, and then how would you know whether one therapist's protocol was more effective than another? So the beauty of behavioral activation is that there are manuals. In fact, um, the first manual um, was written by Beck, and he put this in as a kind of, uh, he was, it was part of his cognitive therapy manual to do behavioral activation. And he thought it was just kind of a nice thing to throw in before you got to the meat of the matter. Um, it turns out that when they tested, okay, what if you gave behavioral activation versus doing all this other stuff? Behavioral activation held up as well as doing all this other stuff, which was a huge outcry in the field. Like, everyone was like, what? That can't be. Um, surely you need the 17 other things that therapists do in cognitive therapy. And there's been more debate and more science and more testing of that. But behavioral activation, this very simple idea, looked pretty good. 
Um, so Beck was the first person who wrote up a manual of how you would do it. Now, when that got the kind of big attention grabbers, then people went in. Um, Hopko wrote another manual that's actually much more complex, gives a lot more strategies, talks a lot more about the different barriers that you're going to hit if you're trying to kind of execute this. Other people have developed manuals, and what they do is they test them. You know, so they'll put people through those kind of manual-driven protocols um, as compared to giving them support and listening to them and being really kind and saying, how was your week, and let's talk about the things that are stressing you out. And they can show that they're systematically more effective. Um, so how would you know if your therapist uses those protocols? You could ask your therapist, um, do you do cognitive behavioral therapy or do you do behavioral activation? And that's a kosher question. A lot of people feel intimidated to ask their therapist something like that. But you know, you ask your car mechanic if they work on Nissans. Um, I think it's fair game to ask your therapist what, what tools they have in their toolkit. So I highly recommend that that's a good question. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, those are, this is a great question. The question is about how often are people doing things repetitively that we don't understand because they have a hidden motivation. It's not a, it's not a brain misfunction. It's not a, it's not a misfire of the brain. It's a kind of, they want a certain reward and it's there for them in this context. Um, yeah, I mean, it has to be true, right? Human beings are pretty darn complex. Of course, we have motivations that are operating outside of our, you know, full conscious awareness. We have motivations that we don't want to talk about with other people. Um, often, we have motivations, though, for sticking with something that we actually can verbalize, and that all too often we, you know, we're so busy chanting at somebody, get out of that situation, get out of that situation, get out of that situation, when then we haven't done a really nice assessment of, okay, well, what is good in this? What's holding you in there? What are the moments that make you happiest? What gives you hope? What sustains you in there? And sometimes people actually have a really good storyline that you have to understand to kind of think about, well, how do we help them move from that spot? Um, but those are really tricky situations. I mean, I don't work with um, you know, kind of people who are stuck in abusive relationships as a therapist because I find it really hard um, to kind of help in that moment because it is complex and it is, it's just, it's got a lot of, strings to pull on to kind of help people mobilize in that context so uh, yes okay yeah so uh, the question is okay we've talked about the idea that some rewards you um, get satiety to and they no longer have the same power is that also the case that certain threats stop having the same power um, and the answer is absolutely yes certain threats do lose their kind of power um, so in anxiety disorders what you have is somebody who's really terrified of something that they can look at and they can go I shouldn't be so afraid of elevators for example um, and it turns out that if you can put a person in that context, if it really is a fear that's kind of too magnified, I'm not saying that we should all climb in the mouths of sharks, um, but if it's a fear that's kind of too magnified and the person is coming to you and saying, okay, look, this is too big of a fear and I know I should be able to kind of conquer this situation, how do I do it? One of the number one treatments is exposure treatment, which would involve take that person and gradually move them closer and closer to being in an elevator. And if they can get in the elevator and they can stay in the elevator and they can spend time in the elevator, the elevator is going to lose its power. It's no longer going to have the same threat, the same fear kind of ability um, to invoke fear. Um, so absolutely, there are some threats and some rewards that become less powerful over time, um, which is kind of fun. Yeah. Okay, so the question is what causes bipolar disorder? And, and um, so a couple of things I would highlight. One is that the diagnosis of bipolar disorder is tricky to make, and there is some, some it is really one of those things that um, is worth having somebody really carefully sort through, somebody who's trained really carefully sort through, because sometimes um, it's a hard diagnostic um, process for people to go through. Um, what causes it? Well, we know that um, almost uh, that we know that um, bipolar disorder has a huge genetic basis. Okay, so um, whether a person develops an episode of mania, which is kind of the defining feature, seems to be tied, you know, almost 85% genetic heritability estimates. I mean, that's really a hugely heritable condition. 
Um, on the other hand, that doesn't mean that everybody who's carrying those genes develops the disorder. So if you take somebody, for example, who has a parent with bipolar disorder, odds are only, you know, 7% or so that the kid is going to develop bipolar disorder. So um, just the genes alone. So the genes probably set the stage, and then other life experiences probably kind of drive that biological vulnerability being expressed in a given moment or, you know, during the during the person's lifetime. Um, and um, there isn't a whole lot of trauma research going on in the U.S. about um, bipolar disorder, but that's a really increasing area of science in Europe. And there are some really good scientists who think that this has an important part to play in pushing the kind of genetic vulnerability towards symptom expression. Yeah. That's a great question. I can answer this. Um, so the question is, um, are experts only available for the wealthy with insurance? Um, and I'm really, really glad you asked that. Because, I mean, it's an important part of healthcare today. Um, so some therapists, I mean, it's part of um, some ethical principles that therapists should do at least some consideration of pro bono work, um, but those slots are often gone pretty quickly. The other thing we do, I know Descartes Lee does this. He's you know the director of this series. Um, and I do this over at UC Berkeley, we will have training clinics where what we're doing is we're training our, uh, he's training his medical residents, I'm training my doctoral students in how to kind of work using the techniques that you know we know about. And those students will see people at low cost. Um, and most medical schools have programs like that where you can uh, work with a resident. Most doctoral kind of therapeutic um, programs also have in-house training clinics. So I'm glad you asked. Uh, yes. Great question. Okay, so did I actually mean it when I said that family members of people with bipolar disorder accomplish more? What's that all about? And what might be happening? And why don't the bipolar show the same profile? Um, there are now six different epidemiological studies where you go out and you get a nationally representative sample, a sample that reflects who's living in a given nation. You know, so you match it on you know SES and gender and race and all those sorts of things, and you capture people from every strata. And when they look at how people do who have bipolar disorder in their families, there is consistently in six out of seven studies an advantage economically among the family members of those with bipolar disorder. Now that's weird when you think about it because we don't usually think, huh, terrible mental disorder that comes with these crushing episodes helps the family get ahead. <laughs> Um, but I think it has to do with this reward system stuff. Um, and I'm really fascinated by what that is and how that might operate. Now, why wouldn't the bipolars themselves end up being super wealthy? Well, some do, actually. I mean, this is a condition where there is just incredible heterogeneity. There's a huge range in how people do. So um, there are many famous, accomplished individuals who seem like they've had bipolar disorder. And you know, to go to the web for one second and type in famous bipolar. Somebody recently, I was giving a talk, and they said, could we come up with a list of non-famous bipolars or famous people who don't have bipolar disorder? Like, it's like the, the Venn diagram overlaps in a, in a pretty significant way. So, so there's certainly people with bipolar disorder that accomplish a huge amount, but there's also people who struggle a lot. And I think that has to do with how well we do in helping people regulate the symptoms, that a single episode of mania can wipe out a lot of accomplishment and a lot of promise. You know, people often lose many of their social resources and their, you know, they may lose opportunities for promotion, for connectedness in the kind of terrible aftermath of an episode. And so the more we could protect people from having the symptoms expressed, my theory would be the more we'd see some of this great accomplishment come to fruition. Yes. One more. Okay. You've got your hand up high. I'm going with you. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, the question is, does non-compliance get explained by the reward system? I think non-compliance is a pretty complex issue. Um, we tried to develop a scale on this, and we found that there were actually six different major reasons why people said, I'm not taking my medications. And, and they didn't link particularly well with reward. Um, sometimes, the, sometimes it was kind of not liking the side effects. Sometimes it was not liking the reminder that you were ill. 
Um, sometimes people had concerns about what those medications might do. Um, what I would say on the whole with non-adherence is the important thing is to understand for any given individual, like why it's hard for them to take their medications and then you can kind of work from there. But in doing that, I think we all need to have some respect for that, um, you know, uh, most of us don't take our medications that well. <laughs> when it's a long-term thing, if you're taking a cardiac medication or a kind of long-term thing, most of us miss doses. Um, it's really easy to miss doses or to get tired of taking a long-term medication regimen. And so um, it's hard for all of us. And then there's reasons why it's probably harder for people with bipolar disorder. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Johnson. Thank you for the terrific questions and for your attention, and um, it's been a real treat to be here.